Welcome to our second monthly webinar, uh, Course in Miracles, Course in Miracles Made Easy. Thank you for joining me. It's lovely to do this. It's a lot of fun for me, and I hope for you as well. <clears throat> so as I always like to do, let's begin with a short prayer, and if it's appropriate, you can close your eyes and join me. <clears throat> we take a moment to tune in and relax. And we open now to the highest results, such that everybody who's joining in this meeting, whether it's live or to a recording, that your higher self speak to you, that your heart speak to you, that you somehow get connected to the deep source of love and wisdom that is you. And we ask for a gift for each person here, some insight, some relief, some awakening, some opening. And we ask that the material that is called A Course in Miracles be transmitted to you, to your heart, and that you gain an understanding of this great work such that it brings you inner peace, and empowers your life in the most wonderful ways. And if you care to say it with me out loud, and so it is, and so it is. So what we're doing is we're going through the chapters of my book, A Course in Miracles Made Easy, uh, one chapter per month. You don't have to have the book to participate in the course, but it'll help. And this month's subject is identity theft. So the question at hand is, who are you? And not everybody in the world gets to think about this too much. We're all so busy. And we have created endless distractions from thinking about who we are. But you know, sometimes you're sitting in the bathtub or about to go to sleep and well, you're sitting under a tree and pondering and you just wonder, who am I? What am I doing here? Like <laughs> all, the, all the things I've been taught I am, is it really true? So am I really my body? Well, not really because your body has changed. You know, the older you get, the more your body changes and it's really the same you, isn't it? And so, you know, you think, am I really my body? And, uh, you know, I, when, I, when I look at my body in my age, I think, well, you know, I'm really the same person I was many years ago. I, my body's gotten older, my hair's changed color, and I have a couple more wrinkles, but I'm the same me. You know, it's, it's, I'm, I'm not a different person than I ever was. Who I am inside, is just me, and that is a me that never ages. That is a me that is deathless, really. And there are people who are incapacitated, they don't, can't use their limbs, or they lose a limb, or an eye. And are they any less of a person for it? Not really. They're still whole in spirit. The body, the body may be disabled or limited, but who am I? I mean, we all know and love Ram Dass, the great spiritual teacher. Well, you know, he had a stroke about 20 years ago, and he's been in a wheelchair since then. And he's physically incapacitated. But to be in a room with him, you don't get the sense that there's anything wrong with him. He is as bright and loving and, and fun and brilliant as he ever was. So even though his body is older and incapac incapacitated, he is who he is. He's, he's a deathless spirit. He's a, an infinite spirit as we all are. And are you your name? Well, not really. A lot of people change their names. They get married, they get divorced. Same person. Are you your bank account? Well, money comes and it goes, it goes up and down. Some people have it, some people don't. Does that change who you are? Not really. If you believe it does, it does, but not really. Are you your address or your profession? 
Do you education? Well, those things kind of revolve around who you are, but you know, there's a wonderful yogic meditation. Who am I? And I used to go to retreats where you'd sit and look in somebody's eyes for many, many minutes and say, who are you? Who are you? Who are you? And it's an amazing introspection. So this is really the key question of all of life, because ultimately, we are children of God. We are, we are beings of light. We are expressions of the divine. And every single experience, for better or for worse, good or bad, hard or easy, is leading us to a deeper, deeper, deeper knowingness of who I am. And there are even people who have passed on. They don't even have bodies anymore and still we're in relationship with them. They show up, they whisper to us, they come to us in dreams and visions and meditations. I, my relationship with my parents is perfectly intact. They both left the planet a long, long time ago, but I feel them almost daily and I talk to them and they're quite real to me. So even without a body, you are who you are. It's, just, it's all there is to it, everything else. Everything else is commentary. So let me give you some practical examples. So in my own case, um, a couple of years ago, I got a, a phone call from a credit card company saying that uh, two people had taken each taken $5,000 cash advances on my credit card. Obviously, the number had been stolen. And somebody had uh, gone on a shopping spree in Dallas with my credit card number, ran up quite a big bill. Well, I confirmed to them that it wasn't me. They said, okay, we understand. And they basically canceled that account. And fortunately, I'm not responsible for it. But you know, identity theft is a big, 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 big issue these days. And you look at all the security measures you have to go through when you sign into an online account. I mean, they, they have like 12 security questions and who was your first dog and who'd you kiss and all these crazy things you have to remember. I don't, I don't. <laughs> But security, you know, there are people who are stealing identities by the millions and billions every year. Well, fortunately, it's just a credit card identity. It's not your identity. But I want to suggest to you that you and I have been subject to a form of identity theft that goes far, far, far beyond anything somebody could steal from you in the world. Our true identity as a whole spirit has been stolen and kidnapped and hijacked by the illusions of the world that tell us that we're small and limited and ugly and stupid and, and vulnerable. So there's a lovely parable that, that illustrates this. I'd like to share with you now. So the story goes that once upon a time, there was a princess who was born into a great kingdom. And as a little child, she grew up and had a lovely, lovely life. And then at a young age, she was kidnapped. And she was kidnapped by fishmongers. Uh, there, there's her palace that she lived in. It's kind of fun, doesn't it? <laughs> she was kidnapped from the palace. And she was kidnapped by fishmongers. And they took her to a fish market. And as a little, little girl, she was trained to be a fishmonger. And she grew up to the point that she had forgotten entirely her identity as a princess. All she could remember was being a fishmonger and living in the fish market. She smelled like fish and that was the world she knew. And then one day, some of the king's servants were in the fish market and they recognized the princess. And they took her back to her parents. And of course, her parents were overjoyed to see her. And they dressed, they cleaned her up and dressed her up. And they put her back in her royal room with beautiful curtains and a bed and incense and flowers and violin music. And she was restored to her original status. However, <laughs> here's the big however, she grew uncomfortable. And she said, this is too pure. I can't stand this. Get me out of here. Get me back to the fish market where I belong. 
Well, of course, her parents didn't listen to her. And she stayed and eventually she remember, remembered her identity and she acclimated. But there's that point at which she was so identified, that's the word identity, isn't it? She was so identified with the smelly, stinky fish market that when she was finally returned and welcomed to royalty, she thought that was foreign to her. When in truth, her divine heritage was that of a princess. And the fish market was the place that was foreign to her. And the Course in Miracles tells us, Course in Miracles tells us that the world we see around us that appears to be so real is actually the perfect inverse of the real world. And if you want to know what's true, take pretty much everything you've been taught about how life works and reverse it. So you've been taught that I'm born, I have a body and I die. I'm subject to death. The Course says you are not. The Course says you're an eternal spirit. The world says you are needy and you need to find a maid and a house and money and prestige and education. The Course says, no, you are whole. You can do all that stuff if you want, but it has nothing to do with your wholeness. Your wholeness is already guaranteed. The world says, if you really want to get what you want, you have to power trip and demand and push and, and annoy people. And the Course says, no, if you really want to get what you want, you trust. It says trust. The Course says that trust is the bedrock of the teacher of gods, that's you and me, the teacher of God's entire belief system. It also says trust would settle every problem now. And how much you trust depends on who you think you are. In fact, everything you do, you and I do, depends on who you think you are. So if you think you're ugly, you're gonna to try to become beautiful and you can never become beautiful because you already are. If you think you're inept, you're gonna try and prove yourself and proving yourself never works because you've based your proving on a false premise. You've based your proving on the idea that I'm not enough. You see anything that proceeds from a lie only creates more lies. Anything that proceeds from illusion just magnifies illusions. And I have a new book that came out this week, Spirit Means Business. And in the book, I identify the 10 illusions that stand between people and success. And the truth is that when you're lost in illusion, you cannot succeed because illusion is based on fear and success is based on love. And as we said in last month's webinar, there's only two experiences you ever have, love or fear. Anything that you do from love works and anything you do from fear falls apart. I'm, I'm a testimony to that. I can tell you lots of stories about crazy things I did from fear and they never worked. I had a, always retrace, retrace my steps to that intersection between love and fear. And where I had once chosen fear, go back and choose love. And that, one of the final sections in the text of A Course in Miracles is choose once again. Choose, well, go back to where you made that faulty choice and make a wiser choice. And we can apply the choose once again to different aspects. You can go back from fear and choose love, or you can go back from a false identity and choose a true identity. Now here's, here's the funny thing, that when you work from fear, that image embeds itself in your subconscious. 
And so you can believe things are real that never happened. And I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, when I was about 15 years old, I, I went to see the Beatles. I saw them in a live concert in Atlantic City. And uh, I didn't hear a damn word. <laughs> the little girls were screaming and yelling and crying. And for the entire concert, all I heard was a couple of bass notes. It was, it was bad. <laughs> That's why the Beatles quit touring, because everybody was going crazy around them. Anyway, uh, the next day, I came back to my uh, junior high school. And uh, there was this girl I wanted to impress named Donna. And so I, I, I used to play bass myself in a rock and roll band, believe it or not. And I had a guitar pick. So I, I took the guitar pick and I etched into the guitar pick the initials PM for Paul McCartney. And so uh, I made up this cockamamie story <laughs> that, that uh, my friends and I heard where the Beatles were going to exit the concert hall. And so we sneaked out and we went around the back door. And sure enough, as soon as the concert was over, the doors opened and out ran the Beatles to a waiting limousine. And I was close enough to kind of grab Paul McCartney's hand and shake it. And as I did, he handed me his guitar pick, which I now wanted to give to Donna, <laughs> the things we do. And I, she swooned. I don't know if she believed me or not, but it was a good, it was a good story. Anyway, I told that story. And actually, I actually told the story to lots of people. And by the end of the day, it seemed kind of real to me. And the funny thing is, as the years went on, and I remember that story, when I think back on it, I see it as clearly as if it was a real story. I can actually see the uh, the backstage door, and I could see the limousine. I could see Paul McCartney. I could see my hand stretched. I could see the the pick, and in, somewhere in my mind, <laughs> in an alternate reality, that's true. But there was no there was no reality reality to it. It was just a story, and it's a silly story. But we, you and I, at young ages, chose beliefs about who we are and they stuck with us even though they're not real or other people chose beliefs about us i i heard a story from a jewish woman who um she uh, she was going on her first date she was like age 14 and she put on some makeup and as she came down the stairs her father was there and it was the first first time he saw her in makeup and he called her a whore and left the room now you know of course her makeup wasn't overdone but her father had this mindset that little girls who wear makeup are whores and so that stuck with her that you know it embedded a negative self-image and so that's just one example you you know if we had an interpersonal workshop here i would ask you who told you stories about who you are as a child that somehow became embedded in your subconscious and you played them out, played them out, played them out, played them out, played them out until you're 30, 40, 50, 60 years old. And you're still playing out a false identity that was never true. And a lot of my work in coaching is helping people trace back the thread to where they learned that they were somebody they were not and help I help them recognize that that identity is entirely adopted you've been adopted <laughs> in a sense and there's a there's a, a phrase we use in my coach training the critical voice is not your own the critical voice is not my own meaning that you were not born with criticism a lot of you are parents, you know, little kids do not emerge from the womb self-critical. They're happy, they're happy to be naked, they're happy to play, they're happy to go to people they like, happy to not go to people they don't like, they're just on their own flow. But then at a very young age, parents, teachers, clergy criticized them, and they began to adopt self-criticism. And, you know, if you if you hear criticism enough, 
uh, even energetic criti criticism, even if the words are not spoken, the energy of criticism gets absorbed, especially at a, an innocent little child. And eventually, you start to believe that it's your voice that's speaking to you. And it's not. It's your mother, or father, or grandpa, or aunt, or nanny, or priest, or teacher, or elder sibling who, who called you something, and they called it you enough that that you start to believe in, and then you come to me in counseling and say, oh, I just, you know, I just think I'm so ugly. And I say, well, whose thoughts are they? Are those really your thoughts? Or are those the thoughts that other people projected onto you because they believed in their own ugliness, and you adopted them until the something flipped, and now you think they're your thoughts. And I guarantee you, there is no such thought of criticism that ever belongs to you. In fact, there's a lovely lesson in the Course in Miracles early, and it asks us to identify only with the attributes of God. And it tells us to state, okay, God is love. And if God is love, and I am an expression, I'm an expression of God, then I am love too. So it wants to build a bridge and equalize us with God in the sense that all that God is, we are. God is joy, and therefore I'm joyful. God is connected, therefore I am connected. And so if you want to play a fun game, just go down the, all the attributes of the good attributes of God. Now, let, let's note here that a lot of us have also been taught that God is wrathful and vengeful and evil and, and not evil, but uh, a punishing God. And that's a big story other people made up because, as Voltaire said, God created us in his, his image and likeness, and we return the compliment. So the Course in Miracles wants us to achieve a radical identity shift. It wants to upend our beliefs that we're limited and ugly and fat and stupid and poor and alienated and alone and depressed and aberrant. It wants us to really flip our identity and recognize that none of that is true. Your personality must have stuff. We all have quirks and, you know, I mean, nobody's perfect on a personality level. However, on a spiritual level, we're absolutely perfect. And one of the difficulties with psychology as a profession is that it identifies us as our personality instead of our wholeness, instead of our spirit. And of course, you do get wonderful um, spiritually oriented holistic psychologists that recognize there's, there's more to us than personality. But, but if psychology just plays around with manipulating personality elements, you're never going to get to the depth of who we truly are. In fact, when I went to Greece, my hostess explained to me that the word psyche, which we usually take to mean mind, like if I asked you what is psyche, well, it was my mind. She said, no, the original Greek for the word psyche, I mean, psyche, that's how you say in Greek, psyche, means soul. So if you're going to be a true psychologist, you cannot just study the mind, you cannot just study the behavior, you cannot just study the personality, you have to study the soul. That's what true psychology is. So what we want to do is move from the surface level of who we think we are back to the depth of who we truly are. That's what we're all doing. That's the only game in town. So, you know, one of my favorite movies is The Ten Commandments. And, well, let me, let me read you this quote, by the way. This is from the Course. The journey to God is merely the reawakening of the knowledge of where you are always and what you are forever. So let's focus on the what you are forever. It doesn't say anything about becoming divine. It doesn't say anything about becoming forgiven. It doesn't say anything about becoming whole. It says what you want to do is remember 
So we could actually describe the Course in Miracles as the world's greatest refresher course. It's just awakening the memory of who you and I have always been, always are, and always will be. So there's not really a journey. Somewhere in the Course it says there's really no journey. You're not going anywhere. You're always here. But what you're doing is you're up leveling your consciousness so you remember more and forget less. So I mentioned uh, uh, Mount Sinai. So, you know, we're told that Moses went to the top of Mount Sinai and there he met God in the burning bush. And if you watch the movie, you know, the Ten Commandments, it's quite nicely depicted. And the story goes that. God, Moses said to God, who shall I tell the people you are? What's your name? What's your name? And God answers, I am. I am that I am. And there's a clue in that. Now, before we even go on, I want to tell you that, you know, you've all seen the movie, The Ten Commandments. When Moses, Charlton Heston playing Moses goes up to Mount Sinai and he talks to God and God answers in a deep voice, Moses, take off your shoes, this is holy ground. So for a long time, it was a mystery who played God's voice. Years later, it was revealed that it was actually Charlton Heston who played God's voice and they used special effects to lower it so it sounded like another entity. But I think it's rather symbolic, metaphysically, that when Moses met God, he was meeting himself. The I am of Moses was the same I am as the I am of God. So when you get to the top of the mountain, man and God become one, woman and God become one. That you know, and, and, you know, Jesus says that he was the son of God, but he also says we're all the son of God, the ch children of God. And in the Course of Miracles, Jesus says many, 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 many times in many different ways, he said, I am not here for you to worship me. I am here for you to find your own worthship. And he says, I am not an idol. We don't need, we've had plenty of idols. None of them worked. He says, what I'm here to do, listen up, gang. What I am here to do is to remind you that you are equal to me as an expression of God. In the Course in Miracles, Jesus did not uplevel himself above humanity. He says, I walked through the path of humanity and I remembered who I am. I am your elder brother who has gone a little further down the path and I'm now extending my hand back to help you Walk your path so you can meet me where we both stand. Pretty good, huh? Jesus did not want you to worship him. He wants you to emulate him. He does not want you to idolize him. He wants you to become one with him. He wants you as an equal peer, not a subservient. Just the way it is. How cool is that? So this word, this expression, I am, so let's go back to what God said to Moses. I am that I am. So metaphysically, if you study any metaphysics, you know that the words I am are the most powerful words that a human being can utter because they are the creative words of the universe. When you say I am, and you fill in the blank, you are exercising the creative free will that our creator with a capital C has imbued in all of us. This is why you have to be extremely, extremely, extremely precise about what you fill in that blank with because you tend to manifest what you fill in that blank with. So if you say, I am stupid, then you gain an identity of stupidity. If you say, I am ugly, then you step into a whole world of ugliness. If you say, I am alone, I am lonely, then all of a sudden you've separated yourself from people and humanity. 
So I want you all to please become more and more and more conscious of what you fill in that blank with. Always think twice or three times before you say, I am something. Because when you say that, I am sick, well, guess what? The, the universe hears, I am sick, and it, it's okay, you could be sick. But what affirmations do is they reverse that. So they say, I am healthy and whole. Well, ooh, that feels good, doesn't it? I'm perfectly lovable. Ooh, that feels good, doesn't it? I am, I am attractive and radiant and full of life. That sure feels good, doesn't it? And as you claim an identity as a, as a beautiful whole spirit, everything lifts. And people start to be attracted to you. One of the most attractive women I ever met was in a wheelchair where she was at this workshop and she just sat there and she just radiated. I, I just found her terribly attractive, and she had no, she had no sense of being limited. She was, she was just a delightful, beautiful, you know, magnificent, glorious spirit, and that's that's what I saw. <laughs> she got my attention. For her, her I amness was far, far, far beyond a wheelchair. And so, this is the meditation of a lifetime, friends finding out who I am, and saying it, living from it. And so the Course says this. It says, the mind is very powerful and never loses its creative force. Talking about the power of your mind now, your mind and mine. It never sleeps. Every instant, whoo, Every instant it is creating, every thought, every thought you think is creating something for better or for worse. And that free will says you can create a mess if you want, but it's still your creative power. And very often I'll say to people, you know, you've used your mind so powerfully to create a negative self image, the same mind tilted, can flipped, can create a positive self image. So so you, but you've been become a master of poverty, a master of lack. And, and you, you, wherever you look, you see lack. You are a powerful, <laughs> powerful creator. You've created lack wherever you look. I said, well, the good news is that at any moment, you can be a powerful creator of supply wherever you look. The same mind that created lack Create, can create supply. The same mind that created illness can create health. The same mind that created separation can create loving connection. That's the power of the mind. It is hard to recognize that thought and belief combine into a power surge that can literally move mountains. And Jesus said that. If you say to this mountain, move, the mountain will move. Now here's the best part. I mean, it's all the best part, but I love this part. There are no idle thoughts. Every, all, think, all thinking produces form at some level. And at another place in the Course it says, this is even more powerful, that which creates an entire world can hardly be called idle. This is the power of thought. So what are we going to do? You know, we have to, the course is really a course in mind training. If you, uh, David Hostemeister is a good guy. He's a good Course in Miracles teacher. And he, and he often talks about Course in Miracles as a course in mind training uh, or mind retraining, we should call it. Other people talk about it as spiritual psychotherapy where we are peeling away that which is not us to reveal that which is us. And the Course says that one of our purposes here is to let illusions rise to the surface so we can identify them for what they are and transform them. So this is a good reframe. So when you start to think of yourself as ugly or stupid or poor or small, 
that is your, you know, some people will go down on themselves and think, oh my God, I shouldn't think that. I'm, miss, I'm missing my whole spiritual path. I'm losing it. I'm not getting anywhere. No, that's the most wonderful opportunity to say, wow, I am now encountering an illusion about myself. What is the illusion I've just encountered? Well, the illusion that um, I'm too old to get married. Is that really true? I have this illusion that I'm too old to travel. Well, look at uh, Jane Goodall. She's in her mid 80s and she's still traveling all around the world, championing the cause of primates in the environment. So when you bump up against an illusion, instead of you know grabbing a joint or a beer or having sex or watching TV or going onto social media to distract yourself, say, wait a minute, this is a fabulous golden opportunity. I am now face to face with an illusion that has been bothering my, me my entire life. And I guarantee you that your illusions did not start last year. The illusions that run your life started when you were a kid and they've been running the show for many, many years. And so thank you, God, I now have this opportunity to confront this nasty illusion that has bugged me and I'm gonna shine so much light on, I'm gonna find the truth behind the illusion. So this illusion can never bug me again. And this is how I work with people in coaching. You say, I'm so glad this is coming out because this has really probably bothered you your entire life. Yes, it has. Well, let's flip it now, friend. Now it's the same thing with fear. We talked last month about fear and love. So a when a fear comes up, instead of running away from it, say, wait a minute. If all fear is illusion, then at this moment, I must be believing some lie. What's the lie I'm believing? I'm afraid that my partner will leave me. Well, maybe the lie is that your partner is not gonna leave you. Or maybe the lie is, is that even if your partner left you, so what, you'd be fine anyway. I'm afraid that I might lose my job. Well, okay, if there's fear, there's a lie. And if there's a lie, it's covering a truth. So the illusion is that I would be bereft and have to live under a freeway bridge in a cardboard box. Is that really true? No, the truth is that I've always been sustained by God. And that sustenance is not gonna stop now. One of my favorite lessons is I am sustained by the love of God. Ooh, think of that. Take a moment to take that in. I think I'm sustained by money. Mm -hmm. I think I'm sustained by food. Mm -hmm. I think I'm sustained by my partner being with me. Mm -hmm. Hey baby, but those are forms of sustenance. But you know, Jesus said that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. What does that mean? It means that you think that it's food that sustains you, but not so. Uh, we saw a very good uh, documentary on the breatharianism, people who live without food. Um, I think it's called Something About the Light. Sorry, I don't remember the, it was Something About the Light. And it was a documentary about a number of people who have been absolutely documented and medically proven that they don't eat food for years. There's one yogi in India, he's probably in the seventies, and he hasn't eaten for 50 years. And all of his family and everybody around him attest that he'd never seen this man eat. And they put him in a hospital for surveillance and they put like five video cameras on him and they put um, uh, locks on the door and guards at the door. And they, they observed him for like two weeks. He didn't take a drop of food or water and all of his vital signs were perfect. He walked out as healthy as he did when he walked in. And so if it's not food that truly sustains us, what does? Well, um, does your job really sustain you or is it the love of God through your job at the moment? And if your job went away, would you still be sustained? Of course you would. You might get a better job, you might make more money, you might get a more fulfilling job. So as I mentioned last month, fear is the liar. And anytime there's a fear, there's a lie. 
And anytime there's a lie, there's a truth behind it. And so let us now reframe whatever fear comes up to say, what is the lie I'm believing here? And what is the truth that the lie is covering? Let me now reveal the truth that the lie was covering. Why, what a meditation that is. Boom, 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 boom. You're all over it. So who are you? Who are we? Now, one more piece before we go to Q&A. And by the way, if you have any questions or comments, uh, please type them in to ACP Assistant. And my friend Nishank is helping today. And so he will gather them and do his best to sort through them. And, and in a few minutes, we'll go through the questions. He'll read them to me. So type any questions to ACP Assistant. It's on your chat list there. See where was where was I going with this? Oh, so the last piece is that you and I can reinforce our own divine identity by recognizing the divine identity of others. The course tells us many times that teach no one that he is who you would not want to be. Let me say that again. Teach not no one that he is who you would not want to be. Meaning that whenever you see, whenever you judge somebody, whenever you call them a name, whenever you label them, whenever you identify them as a sick body or a sick mind or a troubled person, when you affirm that identity for them, you affirm the same identity for yourself, you understand? You cannot escape the judgments that you lay on your brother because the moment you judge, you're there with them. And it says in the Course, when you put somebody in jail with your judgments, then you have to sit by the door of their cell to make sure they don't escape. And in doing that, you are now in jail with them. So once again, teach nobody that he is who you would not want to be, meaning that if you want to be free of your negative and limited identities, you have to be willing to allow others to be free of their negative and limited identities. Somebody wrote a book called Love It, Don't Label It. Love it, don't label it. And one of the unfortunate aspects of our current medical system is that everybody has to have a label. I mean, I know lots of doctors and psychiatrists and they say, if you want to get paid by insurance, you cannot walk, let that person walk out of your office without giving them a diagnosis. And so in that moment, that person now has a label. They are now fixed with a limiting identity. Now, I understand why medical has to do that. I mean, there's reasons for that. I understand on a practical level. But on a spiritual level, it's damaging because I'm ADHD. Well, what does that mean? It's a very popular thing to give a, you know, medicine goes through various waves where there's certain diagnoses are very popular and then they fade out and another one comes in and <laughs> goes on and on like that. And some of them are just, you know, doctors and psychologists jumping on the bandwagon, bandwagon, oh, ADHD, ADHD. Well, maybe, but maybe not. You know, I met a girl in Mexico who was diagnosed with a learning disability, and it turned out that she had dirt in her ear. She slept on a, a floor of a hut, and she had dirt in her ear. She couldn't hear the teacher. But and she was diagnosed with learning disability. They took the dirt out of her ear, and she was a great student. True story. And so we've all had dirt in our ear. We've all been labeled for, for having some kind of dirt in our ear or eye. And Jesus said, don't, don't tell your brother to take the log out of his eye until you take the splinter out of your own. My teacher used to say, pull the weeds out of your own garden before you tell people how to pull weeds out of theirs. It's pretty simple, isn't it? <laughs> so we have our work before us, don't we? But it's, it's, it's fun work, isn't it? It's really... We're in the process of becoming liberated from many years or many lifetimes of a, of a small identity. None of us can afford it. 
you cannot afford to live small. I think I have one more quote for you. Let me see if I can find it. One more. Nope, can't find it. Okay. Well, this might be a good time to uh, do some Q&A. Hopefully I can uh, shed some more light on it. We had some really good ones last month. So Nishank, are you there? Can you unmute yourself? Yes, hi, Alan. Thank you. Thank you for helping out today, Nishank. So uh, Nishank is, is uh, transmitting from beautiful downtown Mumbai. Welcome to the wonderful world of technology. <laughs> We're all together on one planet. So. Uh, Nishan, can you call a couple of the good questions and uh, fire them at me and see what we can do with them? Uh, yes. So Monique asked, uh, is there then no best pathway to God or to our higher self? Like we can't do life wrong. Uh, the best pathway is the one that belongs to you. So... You know, each of us has our own path to the mountaintop. And this is where religions get hung up and they think, well, ours is the only way and everybody else is going to hell. But really, you have your own relationship with God. And at every moment, you are figuring out what it is. You cannot do any wrong in the sense that even if you mess up, you're going to figure it out and correct it. So, yeah, of course, says that a happy outcome to all things is sure including your spiritual path. So we're all going to end up with the mountain pass. It's just a matter of time and, and how. Uh, you don't want to get lazy, though, and say, well, I don't care if I mess up because I have time. Because really, the Course says, time means nothing in eternity, but to delay in time is tragic. So you want to stay in your spiritual path as much as you can. And if you mess up, you mess up. And sometimes you learn more from your mess ups than you do from getting it right. Someone once said, what's in the way is the way. So sometimes by falling off your bike to the left, you never fall off to the left again, you fall off to the right, you don't fall off to the right again, and eventually you balance because you get tired of skimming your knee on both sides. So um, yeah, we're on the path. You know, you can never not be on the path. What, what the Course wants us to do is to remember that we're on the path and to do what we can to accelerate our progress so we don't dilly-dally too long or too much. Okay. Thank you, Alan, for that. Uh, There's another interesting question asked by Linda. She asked, if we are expressions of spirit, which is love, how did the ego develop? Somehow we got mixed up into thinking that we're a body. Uh, if you didn't have a body, you probably wouldn't think you're an ego. So there was some... Somehow, we, you know, our identity got interpenetrated with our body. Because if you look at the aspects of ego, it's all the aspects of body. It's vulnerable and it's limited and it's, it's, it's deathable. And um, so, you know, that's kind of the source of it in a way. However, as I mentioned last month's webinar, you can get a little distracted by trying to figure out how the separation started because... The more you study the separation, the more you become conscious of separation and the more you get sucked into separation. And I think I mentioned last month that Ken Wapnick said, if you're in a burning building, you don't go investigating where the fire started, you get out. And so what the Course in Miracles is trying to do is to help us to escape from the bondages of ego and separation by reminding us that we're much bigger than that. And maybe one day we'll understand where it all came from. But I, I wouldn't spend a lot of time trying to figure out where the separation came from because the God said, God said the Course says it never really happened. Why, why study something that didn't really happen? Why, why be a, a master of studying illusions when you could be a master of studying the truth? Now that, that may not satisfy your intellect, but your intellect is never gonna get an answer to that question. Your intellect is never going to answer, get an answer to why is there suffering. Those are all intellectual questions. You have to drop into your heart if you really want to get those answers. All right. And uh, there is another lot of thank yous, Alan, for you. Thank you. And uh, there's another very interesting question. Are there times in our lives when we are not at a job or keeping in the flow of income that is of benefit to the soul? Or is it a lack of awareness 
that has created such a reality? It's usually lack of awareness. Um, I had a woman call into my radio show and she said, you know, when I was younger, uh, I was happy and my, my body was working and I had a husband and a great job and a child. And well, she said, I went through this golden period, a golden phase of my life. And she said, then things kind of started changing and um, I, I didn't feel well and I got divorced and my job changed. And, and she says, what's happened to me? She said, now that I'm gaining more spiritual awareness, she said, I realized that I was always in the light. That, that the light never left me. I just left the light in my awareness. So what the Course wants us to do is to recognize that we're never absent of love. We can turn our backs on love. We can forget about love. But the, the Course is not about changing conditions. The Course is about changing our mind. And so we want to do is everything we can to get our mind back to the knowingness that all is well, that I am loved, and that God is here, and somehow we're all going to make it. It's all about the mind, isn't it? Thank you, Alan. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so uh, there's a question. Uh, uh, see, she says, thank you, Alan. Great webinar. The question is, what should I do if I have to do financial negotiation with somebody who is self-centered? Give in and let him have more? This thought is kind of dragging me down. That's a good question, isn't it? We've all been there, haven't we? Well, there's a line in the course that says, if your brother asks you to do something outrageous, you should do it because if you make what he's arguing about important to you, then you've fallen into the same illusion that he has. I'm paraphrasing. So it says in that sense, we should be humble. And unless we have a really good reason, give. My teacher used to say, when in doubt, give. However, you know, there's, there's a principle of justice and fairness, even in the world. And so if somebody is asking for something so outrageous that it's, it, it just violates integrity to do it, then you have to say no. So you have to really sit with every situation, every request and say, okay, now, is this something that's negotiable or is it not? Is this something where my ego is locking with the other person? And so we have an ego dance going around and around. Or am I being guided to just drop into what's right and saying, I can give this, but I cannot in good conscience do that. And I would say if you're upset, you're an ego. But if you can step back and meditate and pray and say, Great Spirit, Holy Spirit, show me what I should do here, you get an answer. I always get an answer. I've never got, not gotten an answer. So to you, I would say, step back and ask Spirit, what would be the right thing to do here? And Spirit will tell you, no doubt. All right. Thank you, Alan. And a very interesting question that took me back to our coach training. So Carol asked that, uh, I, can't, I came to the realization that I have fixed our tendencies. <clears throat> Sorry, I have fixed our tendencies. So it could be fixing a house, fixing someone else, or fixing uh -huh. someone's life. Yeah, yeah. Can you give me a mantra to combat my fixedness, or is recognizing it enough? <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> well, <laughs> You know, you're in my coach training and other people are here too. And one of the principles of our coaching is that you're not a fixer, that you're really here to help other people fix themselves or find their own answers. And when I, I ask people to repeat after me, I am not a fixer, I'm not a savior, I'm not a guru, I'm not a psychic, I don't have, you know, I don't have to fix this person's life. People become so free I say, how does it feel? They say, oh, thank God, for the first time in my life, I'm off the hook of having to fix the world. So what I would say to you, I think it's Carolyn, is that 
if you can contrast the difference between I have to fix this and I can free this other person and myself and trust that they will figure it out or if there's something I need to do to help them I can do it then I will but it all come from a sense of flow and joy and celebration and creativity not this neurotic need to fix because I'm comfortable with looking at you in pain you want to hold the higher vision of the person and trust that they can figure it out and they will and so can you so let yourself off the hook as a fixer and you'll be in the best position to fix <laughs> um Dishank, I think we I think we have to stop here okay um, I want to close with a prayer and meditation thank you Nishank very much for helping out Sure. Um, I want to uh, close, as always, with a prayer. I do have one quick announcement just to plant a seed for you guys. Um, uh, we're going to be doing a, an in-person retreat. Hey, what happened here? What's, who was supposed to do that? Uh, we're going to do an in-person retreat called Course in Miracles, The Easy Path. It will be with me live December 1 to 6 in Hawaii. We'll have some great guest teachers by streaming video. And it'll be a five-day program at a beautiful retreat center where you can just lay back and be yourself. And we can join with a lot of people who go very deeply into what makes the course work. So we'll announce this more at a later date. But just to put it in the back of your mind, to put it on your schedule, five days in beautiful Hawaii with me and a lot of wonderful, wonderful people. Okay, as always, I'd like to close with a brief prayer. So if you can, close your eyes right where you are. And I want to remind us to keep asking, who am I? Let's affirm some truths. Say it loud with me, uh, loud with me if you can. I am a whole and perfect being. I am created in the image and likeness of a perfect God. I am eternal. I am connected to the source of wisdom that powers the entire universe. I am absolutely lovable just as I am. I could not be more lovable if I tried. I go through my life radiating my authentic self and I give and receive healing just by being the light that I am. The I am of God is the I am of me. I am that I am. And so it is. Thank you all so much for joining me today. I just love doing this. We'll meet again next month. We will send out a, an email message telling you the recording to listen to if you want to follow up on this one or when and where we're going to meet again. Nishang, thank you very much. I love you all. I bless you all. Can't wait to see you again next month. Be well. Have the best month of your life. Mm -hmm.